say what the name of this place is and um, what, where, where is it located? Okay, it's the Peace Garden at Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. Park at uh, 1950 Lemon Avenue in Long Beach, California. Nice. And, uh, and this is a labor of love from the community for the community. Two community organizations came together and wrote a grant, a Neighborhood Partners Program grant, and that's how we started the garden. And then we employed kids through the Hire a Youth Program from the central area, and we built the garden. So can you describe like um, all the different kinds of plants you guys have here? Sure, we have broccoli, kale, we ha actually have two different kinds of kale. This is the Russian red, um, and this over here is the regular curly leaf kale. This is delicious. Well, the Learning Center has a uh, blackboard, and it has uh, seven rows of benches. It's just to have classes um, not only for planting and for healthy living, but also uh, leadership classes. And it's out here outdoors under, under outdoors, the sun? Outdoors, yes. Next to the plants? Yes. And in the summertime, the plants flourish, and you just can't imagine how peaceful it is here. Wow. When I need to have a few minutes, I come in here, and I just sit here and do nothing. I bring lunch here sometimes. So it's really nice. And you have all these signs up, right? Like what? Can oh, you read the, that, the signs, signs yeah. are all sayings from Martin Luther King Jr. And they were done by uh, seniors at the Willow Wellness Center. Can you read that sign for me over there? It says on the left, uh, Martin Luther King. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And the other one says peace, tolerance, caring, unity, and love. So, were you, were you involved in the Civil Rights Movement? I was, actually. I, um, at 15, um, I went, I lived in New Jersey then. I grew up in New Jersey. And my, one of my best friend's brothers, who was older, I guess he was like 19, um, went to Rutgers. And when MLK went to Washington, for the I Have a Dream speech in the march, he took us with him. And we actually marched with Martin Luther King Jr. Fabulous experience. There were so many people there. It was just fabulous. Kind of like, almost like the hippie movement at Woodstock. <laughs> when you were there, did you realize the fact that you were witnessing history? No never occurred to me. My name is Annie Greenfeld, and that's still my maiden name. I have never changed my name because I didn't want the name Greenfeld to die with my parents. Um, so I was born on February 4th, 1948 in Ulm, Germany. I'm Jewish, and we, the Jewish people have, have been, you know, there's been so much prejudice and bias and so much hate against the Jews. I think, I think maybe um, we understand the civil rights movement a lot more than other people do because we've been dealing with it for so long and it's been, it, it's been ingrained in us, you know, from birth um, for generations before us. My parents were uh, part of the Holocaust. My father was in the Hungarian army, and my mother was, um, she wasn't in a concentration camp, but she was a slave to the German sh soldiers. So uh, she went through lots of horrible things and I didn't even know about them until after she passed away. I read her, her papers. She kept like journals on it. And I was just 
She never wanted to discuss it and my father never wanted to discuss it. It was incredible just to see what, what they went through. My father was married before and uh, before he married my mother and his wife and his little son who was about three years old were killed in Auschwitz. Well, where did your parents meet? Uh, at a displaced persons camp in Germany so. after the war. So they got married in 1946 at the displaced persons camp. In fact, yesterday I found old pictures from then. This was their wedding. <laughs> yeah, so we're looking at black and white photos of your parents here yeah. uh, of their marriage at the camp. 1946. This was on August 27th, 1946. Your mom's so cute. Your mom has this like chubby plump face. Yeah. In this yeah. little white dress. Yeah, she's next to your she father. was cute. How old was your mother at the time? Uh, let's see. They got married in 46. She was born in 21. So. Do the math. 25? Yeah, 25. Yeah. And this was actually, you know, I don't, I don't know how they even managed to, uh, to make me. <laughs> because they're, you know, the homeless shelters around with all the cots, well, that's how the displaced persons camp was set up. Yeah, because looking at this picture, um, I see Look that... Look at all the people. They're all from the camp. There's a circle of people around around the bride and groom, which are your parents, and mm -hmm. your parents are uh, under... Looks like they're taking their it's vows the under, under a hoopah. It's a hoopah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the... In the Jewish religion, you always get married under a hoopah. Yeah, and my dad, you can see my dad was 15 years older than my mom because this is his second marriage. Um, and here's, I mean, here's dinner time. <laughs> that was the wedding or? Dinner time, no, just dinner time. Oh, okay, at the camp. Yeah, at the camp. And some of the same people are in these pictures. Oh wow, so this is like years this later. This is 72, and yeah. this is probably around the same time, but some of the same people that were here are in the picture. Where is she? Like, see, this lady is her. Oh wow. <laughs> and I knew a lot of these people. Where's the... So this is a picture of her as a little girl with blonde hair. Um, yeah having yeah. dinner at the See, camp. See, that's my mom. Right. Um, my dad. Where's the other one? And oh, this is here. the same girl with white hair yeah. uh, in the 70s. Yeah. Wow. So they were friends for many, many years. It's just crazy. You know, all the, the people... I'm trying to see if there's anybody else. And that's my mom and me in Germany. Still at the camp? Uh huh. Yeah, I was born at the camp. I don't know. They all went to different places um, from Germany. They had to wait at the dis displaced persons camp to, um, they had a choice. They could come to the United States or they could go to Australia. My mother wanted to go to Australia. My dad wanted to come here, so he won. <laughs> and uh, a couple of months before he got here, his brother lived here already, and that was his main purpose for coming here, because um, this is where his family was. And a couple of months before we got here, his brother died. Your, par your parents are from Hungary, and then... Uh... My dad was in the Hungarian army. Right. Okay. So he was fighting. And my mother was taken by the German sh soldiers in Hungary to Germany. And that's where they met. Do you have any idea of, like, do your parents ever tell you what, like, life was like before the Nazis? Um, they did. They did. They came from big families. 
Um, I think my, my dad had four sisters and two brothers. My mom had one brother only and three sisters. And they were always short on food. So they always had to make do. And growing up, I couldn't understand why my mother kept saying, eat, you have to eat everything on your plate because she never had enough to eat. So that, it kinda, it kinda tells me what was going on in her mind before and after. Um, it's just absolutely incredible that she never ever told me what she went through in the war. Nobody discussed it, not any of these people that we, you know, they, we all met again in New Jersey, and that's where I grew up. None of these people said anything about what happened in the war. Absolutely incredible. And so then, uh, when the war happened, your father went mm. off to fight. Yes. Yeah, he, went, he was in the Hungarian army, and then he went to Germany to fight. And uh, that's when his wife was taken to Auschwitz and his son and killed in the, you know, one of the gas chambers there. And, uh, you know, after the war is when he met my mother. I think, I think he met her in 45 and they got married in 46. And, and so what, what was, your mom was in Hungary also, um, so... She was taken she... by the German soldiers um, and she was their slave taken to Germany yeah I, I know it's personal so just I mean like completely tell me like if you're ever ever uncomfortable with answering certain questions or anything like no, that no no okay. I mean I I think it's important for people to understand what what they went through during the Holocaust I mean my mother was repeatedly raped by the German soldiers um, so when I was about six or seven years old my mother had a nervous breakdown and I think it was all the anxiety from all that finally caught up to her um, and she kind of wasn't all there for a couple of years you know so it was it was a little difficult for my dad of course my dad was my angel <laughs> you know he worked really hard and when he came home, he took me out for dinner, he got me ready for school. He did everything, you know, that a mother and father should do. He did that on his own, so. Um, are there any other experiences that, you're, that you found out about your mom? She didn't talk to him about She didn't, you, but I you found, found out it, through journals. Well, well, through her journals and her paperwork, um, my parents both filed for restitution from the German government. Because if you were in uh, in Germany, in a displaced persons camp, in a concentration camp, in the army. Um, after the war, so many years after the war, I think it was in the 60s, when they finally got their restitution. So this was a, a process of six or seven years where they had to document everything that happened to them. What's restitution? You would kind of call it like a retirement or something like that, but it's from the German government, they were paid a certain amount of money every month oh, yeah. as their restitution for suffering the way they did in the camps. And what was during during the mm -hmm. war? What was your mom kept at? Was she she was in the in, offices in the offices and the you know and she slept in the in the camps. So she was just taken out of the camps when they, when she was needed. Was she ever needed to do like certain kinds of like a? She did manual labor. And stuff like? She oh. did no. I I don't. I did not read anything about torture except the rapes, and they were you know, numerous soldiers. So it wasn't just you know one. What kind of labor was she ordered to do? Um, laundry, washing floors, you know, just cleaning toilets and. It was at a concentration camp. In what city do you remember? It was, uh, no. See, she didn't, she never mm. said what city it was but in. But it was in Germany? It was in Germany, yes. Yes, and they were forced to wear the bands with the Jewish star on them. You know, I don't have a whole lot of pictures left, but these are the ones that I found. 
because um, they're all packed away and I'm, I'm just going through all my paperwork so I can uh, see if I actually kept any of my mother's papers. Are you going to publish them or? I kind of want to put together something. I think it's important for people to know, you know, people who, who um, have been taught that the Holocaust never happened. Um, I think it's important for them to see and to realize the torture that uh, these people went through. And just so you know, um, out of my father's family and my mother's family that were left in Hungary, we are the only ones who did not convert to Catholicism. Why did so All much of your family Because convert? they thought that converting to Catholicism would save them and their families. So we're the only ones who did not. My father absolutely refused. <laughs> Maintaining your identity. And so yeah. they converted during the war? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they weren't in my father's family. Some of them were not in concentration camps. So they were still in Hungary, but that's where they converted because they thought it would, it would save everybody's life and did it save their life yeah yeah it did at a cost at a cost yes because they never really believed in Catholicism so when you came to the United States you were about how old I was uh, just about two years old what do you remember from the camp do you have any memories of the camp I, I know I, you were really young I was very, very young. I just remember a lot of people being around all the time. That's the only thing I remember. You, you know, you were never alone. There was always somebody to, to talk to, to play with. Always somebody around. I just couldn't imagine when we came to the United States and we had our own apartment. Well, where are all the kids? <laughs> Where's everybody I used to talk to? <laughs> It was very strange. You know, uh, in, in um, child research, they talk about like, uh, there's a sort of like subtle feelings of your, of, of your past. And so when you remember like that feeling you had as a two year old, mm -hmm. like what feelings comes up? Just the fact that my mother was very unhappy. I think she was so scared. Um, and I don't, I don't ever really remember my mother being happy at all. I mean, there were times, of course, you know, different occasions where she was happy, but I think she's much happier now. Where's she at? She's, she passed away years ago, but I think she's in a better place now than she was then. At the camp, do you, do you remember uh, what things looked like? Like what color was the rooms and stuff like that? Or, no, <laughs> not, I mean, I think, way back. <laughs> I, I think they were all pretty bland. <laughs> I mean, this is just, you know, the tables where they used to dine. You can see in one of the, mm -hmm. this one, you can see them sitting there. Yeah. And, this and, looks, uh, I, mean, I mean, look at all the people. Yeah. So this is a dining room. This looks kind of like luxurious for like when I think of a camp. Like, uh, I mean, I'm sure there was like a lot of problems, but I just, this picture yeah. just kind of. Yeah, it's a nice picture. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a nice picture. And, and this was, Looks like this people were happy nice. at times at the camp. Well, I think they were happy to be alive. So I think they, they felt like, you know, once, once they, my dad came to this country, he wanted nothing but to become an American citizen five years to the day that he arrived here is when he became an American citizen. <laughs> That's all he ever wanted. Did, did, did the discrimination stop in the United States? You know, I don't think it ever, ever stopped. And it's, I think it's worse in California than it was in New York and New Jersey area. Because most of the Jews that came over settled in the New York, New Jersey area, you know, all along the eastern seaboard. So um, I think 
the discrimination and the bias is much worse here. Oh, so was it as bad in the East Coast? Or? No, I just remember I was, uh, I think I was 18 or 19 years old and I, after high school, I wanted, I wanted to work and I went for a job. Um, you know, the whole interview process, testing, um, to Western Electric. And I was always pretty smart. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college. So um, I figured, let me go get a job. And I wanted something with, you know, in corporate America where, you know, I could rise up. I was top in all the testing, top in all the interviews, and I didn't get the job. And when I asked them why, they said it was because I was Jewish. And I was 17 years old, uh, 18 years old then. Did that make you doubt America or um, have questioned things? It made me question, you know, marching with Martin Luther King when I was 15. And here it is three years later and I can't get a job because I'm Jewish. I mean, I just... I didn't understand how people could be so biased. I didn't understand that. Was there, I mean, your father seemed like very passionate about becoming a citizen. Were there times where he, where he had doubts as well or? No, no. He was very happy. To yeah, be here. he was, he was happy because he was here. He had some of his family here. And even though he didn't get to see his brother, he got to see his his nephew and, you know, his nephew's kids. And we were a very tight-knit tight knit family. My mother had no family here. I love to uh, go again to the Museum of Tolerance in LA. It amazes me because when I was younger, religion wasn't that important to me. You know, my life was more important. I wanted to have fun and do things because my mother was always sad. Now, being a Jew has become one of the most important things in my life. And making sure that nobody else suffers because of their race, color, ethnicity, sexual preference. I don't, I don't, think that bias is a healthy thing and we keep making the same mistakes over again and I realize that there's a saying history repeats itself but could we just stop the bad stuff now we don't need to repeat that seeing especially the discrimination that you saw against African Americans in the, in the United States what was some of the stuff that you saw that uh um, maybe disturbed you or made you feel conflicted about the there, promises that the United States we used to go down my parents and I used to go down drive down to Florida every year and when we were driving down I'd see on the sides of the road when you got to Georgia it was horrendous the way the, the African Americans were made to live in squalor I mean, you couldn't walk from your front door to the road without going through mud and muck and swamp. It was horrible. What did the houses look like? They were falling apart. They were all falling down. It just amazed me. And I used to try to not look. It just made me sick. What was it that uh, attracted you to Dr. King? Because he wanted for, not only for African Americans, he wanted for everybody to be at peace and everybody not to fight each other and not to hate each other. Is there any, any uh, other activities you did in the civil rights movement? Um, I went to a lot of protests, you know, any protests that were in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you know, even Washington, D.C. I went back there years after that. Um, but I didn't, it wasn't that important to me at the time that it occurred. 
it became more and more important. And, you know, a few months later, when Kennedy was shot, I mean, it was only, what, three months? Because it was August when we were in Washington, D.C., marching with, with Martin Luther King Jr., and then in November of 63 is when JFK was shot. And I think JFK being shot kind of woke me up because it wasn't happening to a black man. It wasn't happening to a Jew. <laughs> so if you really think about it, you know, there's hate all over the world. Was discrimination uh, against you or your family like uh, um, pretty frequent in the United States? Or? Yes. Yes. Um, I can tell you one story where I was in, I think I was in the second or third grade in New Jersey. This one kid, I don't know, his brother was our paper boy. And his brother was huge. I mean, I was a little kid. He looked huge to me. But this one kid, and I remember his name was Tony. I don't remember his last name. But he was in my class, and he would always call me a dirty Jew. He would call me a kike. And he would always make references. Well, you know, I took it, and I took it. One day, I was almost at home, and he called me a dirty Jew, and I lost it. I kicked the crap out of him. <laughs> and there's all my friends around. I kicked the crap out of him. I took him and I was banging his head on the sidewalk. And somebody finally pulled me off of him. And he ran home and later on, I didn't tell my parents. Oh my God, they would be horrified if they knew that I was in a fight. And after dinner, our doorbell rang. So I, my mother answers the door, and I'm right there with her, and there's our paper boy, and he said, and he had his little brother with him. And I thought, this is it. This is it. I'm going to get my butt beat. <laughs> well, he stood there and made his little brother apologize to me and apologize to my parents for putting us through that. And I was just there like, what? <laughs> what just happened here? And after, after that was all over with, you know, my parents thanked him and I got my butt beat for being in a fight. <laughs> By your parents? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> By my mother. By your mother. <laughs> Not my father. My father would never. <laughs> yeah. I've been working in the Long Beach community for since 1999, since I moved into Wrigley. I never worked in the community before then, ever. What catalyzed you to get involved? Well, I moved from, you know, the peninsula in Long Beach, how beautiful it is. I moved to Wrigley because I couldn't afford to buy a house on the peninsula. So I bought one in Wrigley. Oh my God, you have to work so hard just to live in Wrigley. It was horrible. And the only thing I could think of doing was to try to make it better. What was difficult about living, uh, about it living in Wrigley? It was very close. Um, I mean, you could hear people think almost. I lived right next to an apartment building. There were shootings in front of my house. There was garbage all over the streets. I mean, I can't tell you how many cleanups we've done. I just kept getting more and more involved to try to make Wrigley a better place. And for a while it worked, up until we had that huge reduction in police. And now it's back to the way it was. It's not a pretty place to live. Well, what are some of the um, other things you've done in the, in the community? Uh, started the Neighborhood Advisory Group, which is still going. What is that? 
It's the South Wrigley Neighborhood Advisory Group. It's just a community group. And right now what we've done is we've received a grant for monument signs on Pacific Avenue. And I'm doing the, um, the tile work for the sign. Hmm. I just love doing things with my hands. <laughs> that explains and, all the gardening <laughs> in different cities well, and parts I of have, the city. And I have my garden at home too. <laughs> On an average week, how many gardens do you step foot in and get your hands dirty in? Well, in my garden at home every day, this one and the one on Pacific Avenue, um, I help start that. Um, there's a, a few. You know, I went through the Neighborhood Leadership Program. I'm a graduate graduate of that in 2003. Um, so I've really dug my heels into Long Beach and I can't seem to leave. What is it that gets you, uh, why do you feel it's important to get, get involved in the community? Because I want it to be better. I want everybody to be at peace. I don't know that I'm gonna be able to make a difference, but you know, if I teach people, if I teach the youth, somebody will make a difference. Somebody that I have touched will make a difference. What made you want to build a garden in Long Beach? Cause, this garden? Because, uh, well, actually, Dee Andrews wanted Councilman. a garden here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only way we, the city couldn't afford to build it. The only way we could do it is for, to, is for community groups to write the grant and manage it and actually, actually, you know, make sure it runs properly two organizations it's the central neighborhood advisory committee and the neighborhood south wrigley neighborhood advisory group came together and that was in 2010 is when we opened the garden when we signed the grant and we're still working together on this garden we had never worked together before and there's all different ethnicities different races and we're still working together. Um, so what do, you, what do we see in the, the, the Latino plot? What kind of plants are growing there? Well, there's jalapenos, tomatoes, um, all different kinds of ethnic foods. And what grows in the African-American plot? Collard greens, <laughs> some kale, you know, lots of greens. Which other and ones tomatoes. are there? Uh, there's a... Well, this Actually, this plot right behind us is the police department plot. The guardian's garden. Yes. And we just plant whatever, and this is for the community. The other gardeners get to take their, some of their vegetables home, but some of them have to go to the community. So they get to take half of their stuff home. The other half, you know, we have giveaways. We probably should be doing one in the end of March, beginning of April. And people go home with bundles of vegetables. We bundle them all up, we cut them down. And uh, we actually feed people and we don't charge them. Nobody pays for a plot here. In most community gardens, they charge $15, $20 every six months. Nobody pays here. This is a true community garden. We don't want anybody to pay a dime. This is to feed the hungry, to feed the community. You said there's a Cambodian plot. Yeah. And uh, what, what, grows, what grows there? Uh, there's garlic, there's uh, mustard greens. I think a lot of the culture is not being taught. And I think we need to show people how we have repeated the past and how bad it is to continuously repeat it. History doesn't have to repeat itself. You just have to remember. Do you think it's getting better? No, I don't. I don't. Because there are still a lot of people that hate Jews, a lot of people that hate blacks, a lot of people that hate Hispanics. It doesn't seem to be getting any better. 
It seems to be getting different, but not better. Um, tell me, uh, what's the significance of, of this garden to you? To what me? Is, what, what does this garden represent to Anne Greenfield? It represents all the different ethnicities and races working together to create peace. And, uh, and it just seems appropriate that it's in Martin Luther King Jr. Park. Why is it important that uh, the stories be retold over and over? Well, it's stories history. Of the Holocaust, it's history. Of the um, and I thought, you know, instead of repeating our mistakes, if you just remember the mistakes it'll get you past it and you won't have the prejudice in the world you need to not forget a lot of people just you know, when something bad happens to them all they want to do is forget about it put it out of your mind well but that's not going to help you you got to keep it in your mind so that you remember what not to do and to do things better that's what you have to do you don't dwell on something. You just want to make everything a little bit better every single day. Is there anything else that, you, that I miss or anything that you want to say? Well, I just, I do want to say something. Awesome, yeah, please. Um, I want to say that this garden was not built by one person. It took a village. And it took youth. And the youth worked their tails off. I can't, we won, actually, the Peace Garden won in 2011 a Neighborhoods USA Award for second place in the multi-neighborhood um, category. We actually raised enough money to take three of our youth and three of us to go to Alaska to compete. You got second place. We got second place. And... And this is nationwide. The, the youth, some of the youth had never been out of Long Beach. We took a Cambodian youth who had never been out of Long Beach. It's the only place he knew. It opened his eyes. And now he's, he's not in Long Beach anymore. He's somewhere else, but he's got a better perspective of life. I think, you know, each ethnicity kind of tries to keep it all in a box, keep themselves in a box. And, you know, the only thing that matters are Latinos, the only thing that matters are blacks, the only thing that matters are Cambodians. And I think if we put them all together, we'd have such a nice rainbow of people. A nice diverse garden yeah yeah and that's what we're doing here but it does take a village <laughs>